Good evening and welcome to our latest In Conversation with Exeter Library. This evening we're delighted to um, welcome Stella Duffy. Exeter Library is one of 54 libraries run by Libraries Unlimited, which is the charity that runs the libraries in Devon and Torbay. These events are free this evening, but if you'd like to donate, there is a link to our donate page in the chat. This event is also held in conjunction with the British Library's Living Knowledge Network and the Unfinished Business Exhibition. So good evening and welcome to Stella. So Thank you. Stella is a writer of 17 novels, theatre maker, Fun Palace co-founder, regular speaker and campaign around LGBTQ women's and arts equality and inclusion issues. She was awarded the OBE for Services to Arts in 2016. I was. I should have been wearing it. I have absolutely <laughs> no place to ever wear it. Long before COVID, I had no place to wear it. <laughs> it's just a big brooch, and I am not a big brooch kind of woman. No, I mean, they're quite big, aren't they? So They are big, although I did think if I, um, anyone who's watched Schitt's Creek, Moira Rose from Schitt's Creek wears a waistcoat and a brooch to bed, and I thought that would be a place to wear it, right? <laughs> Like on my dressing gown or your night. Yeah, totally. <laughs> There's not a lot of call for OBE wearing in South East London, right? <laughs> I'm not sure there is anywhere. Um, but actually, more importantly, which I missed out, is that you are the pat or one of our patrons of Libraries Unlimited, which is very important. So. I have been saying all along I ought to be a matron rather than a patron. <laughs> so I'm not a bloke. And I am a cisgendered, very happily identifying as woman, woman. So, um, and I think matron is good. I, I think we'd have to change what people understand matron to mean, yeah. not Jake's, for example. Hmm. But I, I'm, I like being a matron. Yeah. A matron patron of Libraries yeah. Unlimited. Yeah. So it's great to see you and I'm and this evening we're going to be talking about your latest book which oh. I've, I have only got on Kindle so I can't show a lovely picture of it but I've got one hurrah actually stay there because I'm at home I can go and get the hardback <laughs> I'm crossing to my wardrobe and here it does have so that's the proof proof hardback it's got nice. the most lovely cover it does have a really lovely cover I mean if this was if this was the real world not Covid world and if I'd have had all the book events, thank you so much for having me, but the live book events that mm -hmm. I love, and I'd like to say I've done my best. I've got some alcohol-free martini and tonic nice. and some crumbs of Doritos, which is pretty <laughs> much, you know, the, you know the crumbs of Doritos is what you get at most yeah. events, right? So I'm doing my best to try it. But I would have tried... I was thinking about getting a dress like this so I could wear mm. it to the events. It's that lovely. hasn't happened. But I am actually wearing proper clothes for you today for probably, and, and lipstick, for about maybe the second time this year. Mostly oh. it's yoga pants and, and a slobby top. But hey, <laughs> Exeter, I'm dressed up for you. So would you like to give us a bit of an overview about Lullaby Beach? Because um, I was lucky to receive um, a copy from the publisher and I really, really loved it. Um, and I think it'd be best coming from you to, to tell yeah. people about it. Well, I had, like all of my books, I'm, I'm only ever capable of writing the next story that's in my head. And my wife and I bought a beach hut, uh, God, five, six years ago now. And beach huts, I mean, it was a fluke that we got it. It was a fluke that somebody had left some money to her so we had the money to do it someone we knew was selling it none of it was like oh we always wanted a beach hut we knew they were lovely but we hadn't it wasn't on our bucket list of things we had to achieve and it all just happened really fast and then we because she's a carer for her 92 year old mother we don't get to go away very much at all we haven't left the country for a long time now mm. and um no one has but even before <laughs> Um, and, you know, the last time we had a holiday was May 2019. So it, it is tricky. So having somewhere that we can go to just for the day makes such a difference. Mm. And, um, and I love the sea and I love swimming. That's the book cover of State of Happiness, which is a, a book that features quite a lot Aww. of time. And um, Waves to Emily. Um, yeah, I remember that, I, that <laughs> book. So, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's so lovely for me that there is someone out there who loves that book almost as much as I do. Anyway, um, beach huts are weird. Like, they're really lovely and they are really open and they're really of the elements, even when you close the door. 
but they've always been passed on and passed on and mm. they go through families so the family next door have a beach next door to our beach hut their beach hut belonged to their grandmother and maybe before her because these ones were built pre-second world war and soldiers were stationed there during the second world war and they've just got a lot of history in them yeah such tiny spaces they've got a lot of history and the, the, it's the kind of history that you have around events so holidays or important events or having a nice time with people but of course the seaside in winter is cold and it's Definitely. not full of tourists and it's a very different place mm. my sister used to live in Ramsgate and she and her husband had a little shop on the front. And I used to go and stay with them and help in the shop in, in summertime and help, you know, do that. I was rubbish at ice creams, but very good at the donut <laughs> machine. Um, and, and it was great in summer, but it's a very different feeling in the winter. And it can be amazing and bleak and wild, but it can also be a bit spooky. So I had a sense that I wanted to write something about the history of a physical space. Yeah. About what it's like out of season. I really wanted to write something post Brexit, <laughs> not in the fight about it, but in the, and where are we now? And it's not a COVID book, even though I edited it, that did the final edit last year. So I've been writing for about three years. I decided not to mention it at all because I didn't want to be the Brexit row. I didn't want it to be the epidemic. I want it to be, this is who we are now and how we are. So there's a London sister and a sister who stayed at the seaside. And I grew up in a small town, or well, we left London when I was five. I grew up in a small town in New Zealand, and I really understand what it feels like to be in a small town and want to leave and go to the big city. I also know, because I have loved very many people in that small town, my <laughs> small town where I grew up, what it feels like for them to be left behind. So I wanted to write about that. I am the youngest of seven, and I have five sisters, four of whom are alive, and I'm, their relationships with me are really important. Um, so I wanted to write about sisters. I'm not a mother and I have 15 nieces and nephews and 31 great nieces and nephews. And Whoa. I really <laughs> wanted to write about that diagonal. There's a lot of fiction about the immediate family line. Mm. Very little about those diagonal lines and whether or not we have children. We can have really special relationships with nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews. They're slightly removed, slightly less fraught. And then you get a very different, maybe, maybe it's like a grandparent relationship, obviously, I wouldn't know, but it's, it's a, a bit more free, is my experience. Mm. So I wanted to write about types of family. I also just really wanted to write about me too, from a non-celebrity angle. Yeah. You know, like most women my age, I have had more than my share, fair share, because all of us have had more than our fair share, mm. experience of sexual abuse. Some of it really horrible, lots of it just daily annoying rudeness from the age of about 14 onwards and I speak to my young friends and my nieces and I don't think it's much different for the 20-somethings either which is disappointing but the majority of the Me Too story has been told from a very celebrity angle mm. and both the celebrities who are the um, perpetrators and the celebrities who are those who, who have experienced it trying really hard not to say the word victim there because god it's a dodgy word um and and i don't i'm not even sure i want to say survivor either because mm. i do think that abuses stay with us and they change us and we can live with them and we can grow from awful things but i wouldn't say that that we you know that that i survived everything it's a it's a horrible myth that pushes people to have to do well mm. difficulty and i don't think we should put that on anybody Anyway, so I wanted to write about that. I wanted to write about what it's like for ordinary people. Um, ordinary people interest me far more than other people because, because everyone is ordinary and extraordinary. You know, every life is, or, I mean, my mum and dad were working class people who had to leave school at 14. They were extraordinary, they were amazing. Yeah. Their lives don't, don't make star stories, but didn't mean they weren't really incredible in their own lives. And so I don't know if that's what it's about, but that's what moved me to write it. And, I, and for the writers listening, I think this is this is really important. So I'll just give you a writing tip here. <laughs> Plot is what happens. Story is the thing that makes you want to do it. So plot is where you go and this happened, that happened, that happened. Oh my God, that happened at the end. 
story is the bit where you go, I can feel something underneath pulling me along, pulling me maybe to read, but also to go back to it or reminding me of something that I've experienced. I think that's the difference. And you need both. But a lot of new writers in particular think it's all about plotting. Mm. Not let the story shine. So if I shut up now about, <laughs> I mean, what I think about writing, and I could read you just a little bit, would that be? That would be great. Time? That would be fantastic. Okay. Yeah, and then we can ask you some questions. Yeah, we? thank you. So um, a lot of people who've read it, I mean, it only came out last week, so it's not a lot of people have read it, but a lot of the people who've read it have told me how much they love the character of Kitty. I think you said so. Too. I did. I loved yeah. Kitty. I loved all of them, but I, I, I not all of them. I loved all the oh. women. <laughs> I love all the women. There are some nice men. There's, there, are, there are a couple. I, I, I worked very men. hard. Well, there's only two horrible men. There's two good men. Yeah, yeah. I like. Yeah, yeah. There is, but yeah, there's there are two really uh -huh. horrible men. <laughs> but no, I did love Kitty. Kitty's amazing. Yeah, she is. And one of the things that I wanted to write about was that vibrancy of youth. So this is Kitty in summertime in 1956 and I, I made up two towns one's called Westmere it's out, it's the small town this is based in the other then there's Eastmere it's a bit posher but not where <laughs> she lives um, and then there's of course London. Kitty Barker sidled into the dining room to take the breakfast orders. It was the first day of a new week and she liked to get a good look at the guests first thing. These days she preferred to have a glance over them before they saw her. She changed a lot in the past year she was taller for a start and her bust had filled out. She knew her figure looked good and was fine with it being noticed by the fellows she fancied herself. But a few of the dads this season had made a point of insisting on a cuddle or a kiss to welcome them back. It was getting embarrassing and their wives looked daggers at her too, as if it was her fault their old man couldn't keep his hands, couldn't keep his eyes or his hands to himself. She stood by the sideboard, listening to the new guests. Their excited exclamations filled with a week's worth of hope. I'd just like to say we don't hear the word sideboard often enough anymore. I like the word sideboard. When you part set something in the 1950s, <laughs> you get to say a lot of lovely words, all of which from my childhood. Anyway, um, she, she stood by the sideboard listening to the new guests, their excited exclamations filled with a week's worth of hope. Those seagulls don't have to make a racket. The music from the merry-go-round on the pier is lovely, isn't it? I was just dozing off and caught a bit of it on the wind. Oh, the sea breezes were strong last night. I do like a proper seaside, all the bustle. It's how you know you're on holiday, isn't it? Or that and the kids screaming blue murder for another stick of rock. And they would laugh and dip a triangle of bread and marge into a runny yolk, crunch a crisp rind of bacon pour another cup of milky tea and plan days of pebbles and sand and candy floss, slow afternoons and long nights, and Kitty would wish herself anywhere but Westmere, preferably London. Uptown, downtown, she knew all about Soho. Frothy coffee and cocktails with sweet cherries. <laughs> hey, there you go. Um, frothy <laughs> coffee and cocktails with sweet cherries. Smart lads on scooters with girls who jumped on the back and rode off with good-looking boys, hair flying out behind, cheek nestled into the back of his neck, aftershave and brill cream and change. Danny Nelson was change on a stick. He was a bit flash for a start. His people were a step up or two from the Barkers and their Westmere Views guest house. Danny's mum had been Emma Sutcliffe. Her family were the closest Eastmere had to Gentry, with a couple of dirty great farms stretching right across the coastal tip of the county. His dad was Charlie Nelson, a builder and a big man on the council. The Nelson family business had come into its own after the war, rebuilding the damage and laying foundations for the hope they'd been promised during those long, dark years. Danny, born in 1932 and bright enough to get into the grammar, had surprised his mates when he left school at 16 and went to work for his dad studying for his draftsman's plumbing and electrical papers at the Mechanics Institute in the evenings. On his 21st birthday, Charlie Nelson handed him the key of the door to the works office. Danny was running two teams of men within a year and the whole of the Westmere side by the time he was 24. Even that was not enough. He had bigger dreams and needed extra cash for his plans, which is why he took on the Lullaby Beach job when his dad made the hush-hush deal with Mr Barker, letting the Barkers buy the land outright courtesy of a useful legal loophole and a large backhander. 
For the whole summer of 1956, when Pat Boone and Doris Day were vying for the attention of all clean-cut kids, Danny Nelson spent his Sundays remodelling the old hut right at the end of the bay. A grubby, nicotine-stained room papered with pin-ups brittle with age, next to an old toilet with a urine-soaked floor and cracked wash basin, slowly but surely became a perfect holiday cabin with a kitchenette in the front room, a small comfortable bedroom in the back and a lovely little bathroom with a modern boxed-in bath. Westmere View's guest house would offer Lullaby Beach as the perfect getaway for honeymooning couples and anyone for whom the noise of the pier in the front was just too much. Kitty was drawn by Danny's dirty blonde hair and his knowing smile. She was drawn by how it felt to have him look at her. Kitty knew she looked good. Those annoying guest house dads made it only too obvious. She was tall with long shapely legs, dark haired, her eyes ringed with long dark lashes. Jane Russell to Marilyn Monroe. As it turned out, Danny Nelson preferred brunettes. Sweet 16 and, he said, half questioning, half expecting, when she both bought him a thermos of hot sweet tea and a slice of her birthday cake, a slice she'd refused to eat herself, cinching in the narrow belt on her deep red dress, on her deep blue dress, one more notch. 17 actually, never you mind, Kitty replied, leaning back against the big rock wall that separated Lullaby Beach from the wild field and the marshes beyond. She was well aware of her stance, with one foot up behind, one firmly on the ground, her neck held long, her head tipped back, nipped waist and everything just right. She knew how good she looked. 17 going on 25, Kitty's mother had said, her mouth pursed, coral pink lipstick cracking the lines above her upper lip. 17 and not too old to go over my knee, young lady, her father added, shaking his head. 17 and old enough to know better than knocking about with a bloke like Danny Nelson. It'll get you a reputation and me her brother Jeff complained. Nothing they said deterred Kitty. Westmere was just noise, the same noise, day after day, year after year. Seagulls and the waltzer and the merry-go-round and crying children, laughing visitors, endless smashing waves. Danny Nelson was a very different sound. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. It's always really great to hear the to, to read have an author read the book to you. Yeah, I think I think, it, I, think it, I like reading because to because I came from performance before I went into writing. Mm. For me, not I mean yeah, a whole book is is hard to read, and particularly the big dialogue chunks. Yeah, but but where there's a bit of dialogue and a bit of the prose, you can get a flavour of the tone mm. when you do the writer read. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. I've got some questions, so. Serena has asked, um, when you're writing, do you always feel in control of your characters or sometimes <laughs> do they do what they want to do? Um, hi, Serena. Um, yes, I do. Because when writers sometimes say, oh, the book writes itself and the character just wrote themselves. I'm like, bloody hell, I wish my characters would write themselves. <laughs> I have to do all the typing all by myself. So I am in control, but... So this book now, the one that's published, there's at least four other chapters of Kitty and Danny because um, I enjoyed writing them too much. I was mm -hmm. one who wasn't in control of, <laughs> of how much I was writing. I was enjoying it so much and enjoying writing that relationship so much mm. that I overwrote it. And it's great that those chapters aren't in. I, I, they're still really good chapters and they might even one day make a short story, actually. But they're not relevant to the whole story and the mm. whole story is the difficult part so so yes and no characters do take over and I, if I'm really enjoying writing them because my parents were in London in the 50s and my big siblings were in London they were born in the late 40s and the 50s um because I because of being the youngest of seven my older sisters in her nearly mid 70s now so I have a lot of understanding of that life from people who were actually there and who I'm close to rather than yeah. just research. And I really enjoyed writing it, but I enjoyed it too much. And as a writer, that's a thing to be careful of. Right? <laughs> Don't enjoy it too much <laughs> because I mean, it's, it's lovely, but it's, it's not about you. It's about the reader. And so you want to give them a balanced book. 
Um, the characters are so important in this in this novel, though, aren't there? And their relationships are just like pinnacle to the whole sort of yeah. story, really. So I can sort of and you really do feel that when you read it, that, you know, that they are well, they are everything to it. Aren't they are. They? Yeah. And it, it's also it wasn't I mean, it's not a waste. You know, I, I normally do sort of four, five, eight drafts of a book. <laughs> um, it's, it's never a waste to write things and then cut it. I think the waste would be to dream things and not risk yeah. writing them. Because I think quite often we have this story in our head that 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 if we write something, it, it has to stay. And, you know, look, I mean, this is... Oh, man, it's so useful being at home. So, so if I was Michelangelo, right, I would have to spend two years' worth of money or my patronage buying this vast chunk of marble and I would have spent years trying to get someone to pay for it for me and I would take a chisel and it would be the scariest thing in the world because when I chisel at it I might ruin it mm. first thing me I'm Stella I do writing <laughs> better than that <laughs> if it's rubbish it's just paper and actually I write on screen so it's not even just paper it's gone and it doesn't matter so I think as writers we can get very caught up in having to get it right first time and actually getting it wrong is where the magic is it's just like making a fun palace people of Devon all of whom know so much about it particularly <laughs> people of libraries unlimited um it's, getting it wrong is where we learn yeah and from getting it wrong we can make it better very long-winded answer sorry that's okay i'm sure serena was I, I think that was a fantastic answer and i think you answered lots of different uh, <laughs> threads of that question um i've got one here from um super fan emily um said that she's waving so hard to you and fangirling so hard so uh just for you just <laughs> for you um so yeah the, the women in this book are amazing they're strong and resilient and really supportive of each other and in the beginning of the book I don't know whether I should give away too much I mean it's fairly sort of it happens pretty quickly doesn't it oh, all of the reviews are going so Kitty commits suicide I'm like, <laughs> I was saving that till chapter four but go ahead yeah, Kitty commits suicide. I was just going to say... Let, I yeah. Actually, no, let's not say commit, commit suicide. No. We don't say that anymore. Kitty kills herself. Yeah. They so, did say commit suicide then, though, in, in the book, so... Yeah. yeah. Um, but she's such an important figure in all their lives, isn't she? So when, when, when they lose her, mm -hmm. they're angry and yep. they're cross with her for leaving them, but yep. they don't know, uh, you know, they don't know why she, you know, yep. why she did what she did. Yeah. Um, and was that difficult to write that sort of, or did you sort of use your own experience to, you know, own experiences of sort of relationships yeah. to do that? Um, I have known far too many people who've killed themselves. That wasn't why I wrote this. However, when I was in the process of editing it a year and a half ago, one of my oldest friends killed herself. One of my oldest, dearest, most important, most loved, um, a woman I went to high school with, we have a group of friends, they're in New Zealand, every time I go back we all get together, um, they all get together without me, but I like to think they only get together with me, <laughs> um, and we found it utterly shocking, mm. and she, of, of all of us, you wouldn't go, oh that's the one who's going to do that, mm. you know? And you would, I mean, in retrospect, some things make sense, but not all of it. Um, a very dear friend killed himself when I was in my 20s. And then some other people who I've known less well, but I've had a couple of really important people. And I think it's a thing that we, like like all the taboo, I mean, God, this book, suicide, abortion, rape, so we've got all the taboo things. Um, they're all the things that we always say we don't talk about enough, but actually, I think people do. But because it's so taboo, mm. the minute we've talked about it, it'll go silent again. So, I, you know, I know people who talk about the abortions they've had. I had an abortion myself at 19. I know people who talk about the miscarriages they've had. When my wife and I were trying to have children just after I had my first cancer, 
she miscarried. I then lost all five embryos that were made before chemo made me infertile. We talk about it and it sort of feels like people open up these spaces and then immediately get shut down again. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, oh, you're so brave to talk about that. But I had that conversation with loads of people. So I don't feel brave or especially honest. I feel like I hear these conversations. I know they're happening. But every time they do, it's almost like this, there's, they're damped down immediately. So I wanted to write about, I mean, I was writing about this anyway. And then when our friend killed herself, I did have to say to our mutual friends, you know, this is really weird, but I am writing about this and its repercussions in an entire mm. family. I've been working on this book for two years. I'm not going to stop now. And they no. were just great to know. So I think, so, so there is some personal experience in there, but actually I'd finished the first two or three drafts before I wrote it. The not talking about things, the, the story that we don't talk about things, mm. I think is weird because it's in all our fiction and it's in all our movies, suicides and women miscarrying and abortions and heartbreaks and abuse. It's everywhere. It does happen all the time. I do hear people talking about it on Woman's Hour on the six o'clock news. And it, that's as if it goes into an echo chamber and it's just shut down. Yeah, so, I, think it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I think, I guess it's a, a lot of people still feel quite uncomfortable talking about it. God, I think. I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But that's, that's the thing, isn't it? And I guess that's probably why people do sort of shut it down is because yeah. it's easier to do that than it is to go, oh yeah, that's, yeah, I know about that. Or totally. yeah, I've had that happen to me. Um, and and I've, been asked, I've been out as a gay woman for over 40 years. I say, knowing it's going on Facebook Live, I had an abortion at 19 and I'm like, oh shit, am I going to get horrible messages on, on, on Twitter again, like I have before? Yeah. Or talking I hope not. about a thing that at the time when I was 19 in 1982 was a really big deal. It's still a really big deal because we're still not giving women control over our own bodies. And in some nations, Poland right now, you know, at least America's Trump free, so that's hopeful. But the stuff that's happening in Poland to women right now is utterly shocking and why it isn't getting more attention I genuinely don't know you know it's all just being that's being shut down and that's being shut down by government right so I've got some more questions so I've got one from Jez so actually he's pinched one of my questions because I was going to ask you this oh. one so we'll, we'll we'll amalgamate this one so you have written 17 novels uh -huh. um which is amazing um and you've written really different genres um, so you've done your plays, you've done your short stories, you've done your crime, you've done historical. Yep. Um, so Jez says, uh, do you consciously adapt your style to the genre or the form you're writing in? Or, sorry, my phone's just gone off. <laughs> or do you think it's good just to ignore rigid genre boundaries and mix it up a bit more? Jez, I, I wish I was as clever as you're giving me credit for. <laughs> I, I literally only write the next idea in my head. Seriously, I am not capable. I mean, God, I would be, if I would be the bestseller, my publicists and my publishers keep wanting me to be if I was capable of writing for the genre. I'm just not, you know, I'm rubbish at it. I get, I get an idea and it feels like it's in and of me and it's in my guts and it's in my mind. And then I find out as I start writing it, what kind <laughs> of a book it's going to be. I am, you know, other people, dear friends of mine, are those people whose books you pre-ordered <laughs> two months in advance and the book comes out the same time every year and they do this massive publicity tour. And then, you know, they're great mates. I know those people. I cannot think like them and I cannot write like them and I know it's a specific skill. I'm happy with the skill I have and I am grateful for it. I just really like stories mm. and for me it's it's the what's it's the what's going on and I'm not I, I, I'm not capable. So this book could have been way more crimey. It, it absolutely could. It's got some stuff in it that could have made it much more, much more, I don't know, explosive and much more like a classic suspense noir crime novel. But it, for me, it wouldn't have done justice to the intimacy and the mm. genuine pain of the story of each of those three generations of women 
if I had have really exploded it at the end, it explodes pretty big anyway. But there was a draft, or at least a dream, where I might have done that. And it just didn't feel like it was true to the characters of the book. So that's not what happened. So yeah. it didn't ever feel like I mean, when I when I read it, it did it felt like it did feel like it always was what it was. And I know that probably is wasn't, but it it yeah, it was just you have to read it. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um the uh, could I just also say about this though? The three time periods is probably one of the hardest things I've ever written. And I was really fortunate in that my editor at Virago, Sarah Savick, um, went on maternity leave. And during that time, I worked with Rose Thomas Shusko, who's also an editor there. And Rose basically played bad cop to Sarah's good cop because Sarah had been, you know, looking after the first draft, making it all lovely. And then Rose came in and she was like, nim, 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 nim. and I got to work with two people who really looked after both the sort of spirit of it and then the actuality of it. Not that Sarah couldn't, but she wasn't there, which meant that Rose got to play a very good bad cop. Mm. Getting the time scale right on this took. Um, see in the corner over there that's a very large roll of brown paper oh yes i can see that <laughs> other people use all sorts of things i use a whiteboard and brown paper and i don't even i do sometimes use post-it notes but at one point i had so much writing about which chapter should go where it was just agony and i ended up just i cut out just a massive sheet of that spread it all out looked at the chapters color coded them <laughs> and finally found a way that it flowed right I don't know why I'm telling you that but oh, um... interesting people will love it <laughs> I, mean, I think I think you know it is it, it's you know fundamentals of the story isn't it the three type the three oh, yeah and, 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 it, and it's I, important that it it does flow and that it fits and together it, and, and it allows each of the generations to matter rather yeah. than I mean I do think in some ways it is Kitty's story more than anyone else's but the others are really important as well. And so if it had all been around her, I think that would have overweighted it in that direction as well. Yeah, I, like, I really liked the, the three. And I think even if you'd done two, I think just having Lucy as well, um, it just really, and yeah, this, it's, it's got a, it's, yeah, it's really, it's got a big surprise. I love it. <laughs> it's got lots of surprises. And it, I mean, it has got some icky bits as well, where you go, <laughs> oh believe me writing this bits was so hard yeah um there's a I, couple of chapters in the in around the middle of it yeah. i was sobbing yeah them, just sobbing but it, that's all right because if i didn't feel it mm. and then i you know edited them and made them better because when you're sobbing they're never very good they're always a bit overwritten <laughs> um but then i i think if i hadn't have felt it emotionally they wouldn't also have impact for a reader yeah I oh, know that's true I think it, it was it is a very emotional read I think it's um yeah it's oopsie I've got some more questions I've got questions coming in fast and furious here so um Catherine asks how um you explained how your beach hut partially inspired the book do you find the fictional world of lullaby beach seeps back into your real life experiences when you're in your beach hut um, no. and <laughs> does the story <laughs> does the story change now you've experienced the place uh, no, um, no. And it's also not the same physical space. I mean, I made it a really different kind of place, town, than yeah. our beach hut is at. Um, yeah, no. I mean, at the, the, I mean, I've mean, i made Lullaby Beach the most gorgeous beach hut you could actually sleep in. It's got I, a bathroom and everything. I wanted to go and stay there. I yeah, mean, no, me too. Just, yeah, totally. I, I, would, I would have moved there if I were her as well. <laughs> Uh, no, our beach hut is, it, I promise you, it's a beach hut. It's got a baby belling stove. It's got two stalls, bit of a divan that's got a load of rubbish underneath it and some Wellington boots. I was going to say gum boots, <laughs> more than New Zealanders. Um, and, and it's cold in winter. And we're not allowed to go there now anyway because of COVID. Because we're not allowed to leave London. So so do you all stay there all year round? Cause no, no, you, can't, you can't stay there. They're, then you're not, it's legal, it's not oh. legal to stay. Um, they're not, not sleepover beach huts because the ones some of the ones in Devon get taken down for the winter and packed oh, away yeah. and and then put back out again yeah <laughs> yeah is that was that, that where you've got those wild seas yeah I think Budley Beach I think is one of them oh yeah yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I think theirs go. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, but I think Westwood Ho, they keep theirs out all year round. And, but um, you guys have got to see, I grew up in New Zealand, so I like a bit of prophecy. I do love our beach hut, but it is sort of part Thames estuary, part North <laughs> Sea going, hi. <laughs> it's gentle and lovely. I like a big wave that knocks you over. Yeah. It's um, I, th I think there's something really special about it. I, I had to aspire to have a beach hut, but they are really expensive down here. Yeah, like, they're, well, they're, they're bloody expensive and Kent. Yeah, I imagine they are. They're not cheap. Um, well, I've got another, actually, I have a question from Emily, so I, I better ask this one because uh, I could be in trouble otherwise. Um, Emily says she, um, she can't wait to read Lullaby Beach. She did tell me today that her copy is coming this week. Um, do you ever feel, oopsie, since, um, since Saz Martin, is that from State of Happiness? Yes. No, no, Saz Martin is from my first three books and then my fourth and fifth that weren't in an order. Uh, oh. they, were my first, they were my crime series. Ah, feel yeah. an interest to write sequels? No. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, There's your question. There's your answer, Emelina. <laughs> Saz was really of her time. She was, I mean, the first book came out in 1994. In 1994, God, that's 27 years ago. I know. I wrote a lesbian detective in a mixed ethnicities relationship who was bisexual. I mean, lesbian as in the relationship was lesbian, she was bisexual. I mean, now that's still seen as groundbreaking. And we also still so rarely see um, queer women on television, for example. If we do see queer women on television, we're almost always in period costume. You know, to see contemporary queer women, to, to see what Russell T Davies, for example, has done so well and so often for gay men, to see contemporary drama that represents us in our multiplicity, which is what I was trying to do with those books, really different kinds of women, Certainly not all white, certainly not all middle class, um, certainly not all able-bodied either. Um, just the multiplicity of what women might be in sexualities and behaviours. I still think those books are really groundbreaking. Unfortunately, because they were set in the 90s, they're also really dated. <laughs> um, I mean, seriously, there's no mobile phones in the first one or two. Wow. Um, I, I don't know, just, it's just really different. People go to phone boxes. Um, so that's very um, retro though now I know. <laughs> there's no internet either so she actually has to be a proper old school detective also she's a rubbish detective because <laughs> i didn't know anything about it um i just made i just wrote a rubbish detective and actually a rubbish detective is such a great character because then the reader's with her all the time mm. they're not she's not smarter and cleverer than the reader like annoying hercule poirot who ended up annoying agatha christie so much she killed him <laughs> uh, that that I'm, I'm all knowing and I know so much better than anyone else of Poirot's was actually not very useful. I mean, readers loved him, but she didn't. I did. So I do. Sorry. Well, <laughs> I, I far prefer Marple. I think she's so. Oh, I do. I love Marple too. But I, yeah, I just like his. I like his. Uh, you know, his, his pomposity. His, yeah, and his yeah, his just <laughs> and, yeah, all that, all of his, all of his flaws. I love them. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, anyway, Saz is deeply flawed, and it's mostly flawed because she's a crap detective. And what I didn't know in the first book, but became very useful in the next books, is that because she's not great, she has to bring in other people to help her. So I ended up creating this little community of people who are the detective. And that was utterly accidental, but readers really liked it. So it was really of its time. It was also really of who I was then. Mm. Um, and I don't think I, and you know, to me, Saz is still somewhere out there in her 30s. I'm really not. And I'm not sure I could write a book for those women in their 30s now. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be very different, wouldn't it? All those years later. Yeah. So. Um, so I've got another. Oh, I've got a Fun Palace question. So I know that you've um, you've stepped down as director, haven't you? Uh -huh. Yes. So, um, um, Exactly two weeks ago tomorrow. What a yeah. mega crying sobbing! <laughs> I was going to say, Seriously. have you have you recovered yet? <laughs> only, only just. So yeah, I don't want to set you off. So Jez has said, um, "What does Joan Littlewood mean to you, as regards her ideas for Fun Palace and the ideals that lay behind them?" Well, it's more about the ideals that lay behind them because I think her idea for Fun Palace was stupid, genuinely. <laughs> 
I'm not sure I ever said this before. No, I'm sure I did. <laughs> Joan and Cedric wanted to build one building mm. and it was amazing. And it was going to be for everybody and it was going to be huge and it would have all the arts and all the sciences and all the tech and it was going to be in the East End. And no one had ever considered building something for the people of the East End before. So those are all good reasons. But it was still going to be just one building. Yeah. And that would mean that everyone else couldn't access it. So it would have been great for that community. But like all capital builds, only good for the community where it is. Whereas what we did with the Fun Palaces idea, bear in mind that when we started this Sarah Jane and I eight years ago, we were still living in <laughs> austerity. Um, and, you know, those of you who are libraries people will know how, how well that worked. Um, and... <laughs> And what we were doing was we were saying, look, we've got all this space. We've got all these buildings. They're just badly used. You know, they're not shared enough. And that's why I think that the libraries, I mean, Libraries Unlimited, but all, you know, all the library services that we've worked with all this time, that's why the libraries jumped on the idea so fast, because libraries already were community hubs. Libraries already are part of the community. Well, I say that, not all libraries. As some of us know, right, sometimes the person who is supposed to be the one who opens the doors is a bit of a gatekeeper and keeps some people out. But compared to the museums, the theatres, the science centres, the universities, libraries, even the ones that had gatekeepers, have always been the ones that perceive themselves as being for the community and a space to open for the community. So... I think the only thing wrong with Joan's idea was that she was a little over keen on professional actors and professional artists, but which you had to be in the 50s and 60s because no mm. one was paying ordinary people to be artists. It was only the posh people who were getting paid to, to be it. Um, she was a little keen on, on creativity being led only by those people. And she wanted to build a building. And Cedric Price's design was phenomenal and it never got made one of the very good reasons it never got made was because in 1965 it was going to cost five million pounds. Wow. In 1965. <laughs> and in 1975 it was going to cost 15 million pounds. And Cedric Price firmly believed that a building should be torn down after 10 years because by then you wouldn't know what you wanted it for in the first place. Now I don't think he's wrong, but it is a bit bonkers. So us supplying their ethos of everyone a genius, everyone an artist, everyone a scientist, it should be open to everyone, not just to access, but to lead. Mm. And I think that's where we made the change accidentally because we both personally felt it, Sarah Jane and I, because of yeah. our work in the arts for years. I think that's the big thing we added, that we said anyone could lead this. Yeah. I have to say, trying to explain to services, don't deliver, stop delivering. <laughs> Let the people do it, even if it's shit. Let them do it because next year they'll be better at it. They'll free up your time. Just give them the space for a bit. Persuading people of that has always been the hardest job. Yeah. And yet it's also always been where the greatest growth has been. Where Because I, I now see Fun Palaces as a leadership organisation. You know, every Fun Palaces maker is, has become a leader of some sort. And some, seriously, some of the people who did it, like, five, six, seven years in a row are leading in ways, phenomenal ways. So yeah, I, I think I love Joan's work. I love her maverickness. I love her don't care wildness. She's much better at don't caring than me. I know I look a lot like I don't care, but but I do get hurt when people say horrible things or don't yes, understand. Yeah. I, I know that she did because people who loved and knew her tell me, have told me that too. But I think she was better at presenting a don't, don't care facade. Or maybe it's good that I say I do care. I don't know. I genuinely don't know. But um, yeah, it's been hard to leave. Yeah, it I was bet. the right choice. I am training to be a psychotherapist and I have two placements now with six clients who I really like working with and a lot of study. And, and I, <laughs> I do have another book to write. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am... What Fun Palaces gave me was an opportunity to work a lot more with people one-to-one -one and one-to-group. And yeah. I think that in the longer term, that's the kind of therapy work I'll be doing. Not dissimilar, actually, because it's all just about supporting people to be who they want to be. 
it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, I've realised that we are we are actually now over time. Sorry, but sorry, fine. I it's fine. Too, I'm sorry, I yeah. it's fine. Um, but I've got a couple more questions. So, so um, from I've got Carol saying, um, do you listen to music when you write, or do you prefer silence? Um, and where does the yoga and writing workshops idea stem from? And she loved Lullaby Beach, and she read it in two days. Thank you, Carol. Um, uh, I know I don't ever listen to music when I write. It makes me crazy. I, I like silence. Uh, I, I live in South London. <laughs> I don't get a lot of it, um, but I do like silence. I, mm. I have tried to. It gets in too much. It influences me too much. It takes my head somewhere else. Um, yeah, yeah, I've heard many people, lots of authors I've spoken to, there's very, very few that I've spoken to who can listen unless yeah. they're listening to something that they've listened to so many times yes. that it's just like a noise. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it, it, it becomes too much a part of it. I mm. did once write a short story that I that nearly won a prize and didn't, that I think is still a very good short story. And I wrote it to the accompaniment of Japanese avant-garde, very loud, quite scary music by K.G. Haino. And you can tell from that story that it was written to that accompaniment of music and it mm. works really well, but just the one. Um, and I've written about 70 short stories, so just the one. Um, the yoga and writing is, I've been practicing yoga for most of my life because I'm the youngest of all of, all of us. Um, my big sisters taught me things that they picked up and you know, it was the 1960s, so they picked up lots of cool groovy things. Um, <laughs> I love yoga. Yoga has got me back my mobility after both of my breast cancers. And I find it flows into and supports writing really well. So I, I trained in yoga teaching specifically to bring it together with creativity. And I've now run three or four yoga for writing workshops and turns out it works for other people too. Oh, wow. So I, I teach a little yoga flow and then it flows into a writing exercise. And then we go back to another yoga flow and that flows into a writing exercise. So I'm really, lockdowns of shame in that mm. I haven't been able to do them live, but because I haven't been able to do them live, I've done them online and people have been able to come from all over. So it's great. Yeah, I think that's been a quite a good thing, hasn't it? I've, yeah. I, I, I did a Annie Sloan painting <laughs> workshop cool. online on Saturday. Cool. Brilliant. Yeah. It was great. But yeah, that, that was from people from all over that, you know, Absolutely. Was, so yeah. I think it does have its advantages and obviously it's big disadvantages. Yeah. Um, so um, just one question to finish on. Um, and I've just completely, it's gone out of my mind. So um, what is next? What oh. have you got planned next book wise? Hmm. Well, I can't tell you because I've only written 10,000 words, but uh, this book I'm supposed to be delivering at the end of the year, which I won't. <laughs> but they're fine with that. I mean, I just won't. There hasn't been time. Um, I'm going to support the finding of the new person to be the co-director with Kirsty mm -hmm. by, by supporting some of those interviews, but I'm trying to leave it, well, I am leaving it to them. Yeah. Um, I'm just being helpful where they need me. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm, my second year of a doctorate <laughs> a doctorate i'm the girl whose parents said school at 14 and i'm doing a doctorate and if i get my doctorate i will have a d prof probably when i'm about 65 but anyway i'm doing a doctorate next to central psychotherapy and this year is when i have to really refine my research question i'm interested in postmenopausal women and creativity i think there's something yeah. don't know what it is yet and it's very early days so it may end up being something completely different um but you have to start doing some work on that um i'm writing a piece for common ground which is a working class writer's book that's coming out next year i think um and i'm trying to experiment with not doing stuff all the time doesn't sound like you're succeeding too well. Pretty rubbish at it so far, <laughs> has to be said. But part of the thing about Fun Palaces is, is it was never a two day a week job for me. No. Or for Sarah Jane or for Kirsty. I mean, because we're the people who, it was a startup for us. Yeah. Um, and it needs to become that for someone else. It needs mm -hmm. to become the part time job that we always said it was. It, it was, most weeks it was a four day a week job and there was always other stuff and somebody would send a Twitter message and I'd answer it at, you know, eight o'clock at night or six o'clock in the morning because that connection helped it grow. Yeah. It doesn't need that now. It needs somebody else to take it on in a different way. So I do have a lot more time. I'm not very good at just letting it be. No, I'm, I suffer with that as well. 
Well, it's, it has been amazing to speak to you again, Stella. It has been an absolute joy. Um, if, you, if you've got your book there, I can hold it up because I can just say that um, you can order Stella's book um, from the our friends at Credit and Community Bookshop have got the link. Oh, yeah, in, you want to order it from a community bookshop. Which is in the chat, so you can order it from there. If you don't want to buy yourself a copy, you can also order from Devon Libraries because we have copies on better. order. Very good. So, so yes, so that's, both of those do both yeah. things. <laughs> it is a great read, and it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you again. And I wish you luck with your uh, studies in this over the next yeah. year, and hopefully we'll be able to get you down to Exeter in person when all this madness is over. It, it will, it will come, right? It, it will, will come. yeah. No it will. The crevices are going to come up. It will come. We just it will indeed. Out. We will. Thank you, Stella. Thank you very, very much. Lovely to see you all out there, even though I didn't see you and you saw me. <laughs> <laughs>